All right, good morning, Chair Postman, members, Garrett Volandroff, staff and guests. Uh, lobbies are open. Recording has begun. Good morning, everybody. We'll convene the board caucus meeting for Tuesday, June 11th, 2024. Uh, our first agenda item is our quarterly human resources uh, report, and uh, we're joined by uh, Anita Bingham, our HR director. So I will turn it over to you, and I know we got a slideshow coming. All right. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Wait till Dustin gets our slides up. <coughs> we'll be uh, covering those topics today. So just a reminder that July 1st is the date for our 3% general wage increase. I know we're all looking forward to that. <laughs> and June 6th was the increase in the cap for our vacation leave accrual. So it went from 240 to 280. So we're doing the math at seven weeks, which is quite a bit of leave you can have on the books. So I'm hoping that people still continue to use their leave because um, people need to. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Next. Um, our staff continue to use the tuition reimbursement benefit, although we're down a little bit from last year. Um, the total allotment for the 23-24 biennium is 50,000, so we're well below that, but <coughs> nice to see some people are able to take advantage of that. We have another month or so to add into that total, but. How many people is that, do you know? I don't know, yeah. Uh, we continue to see a decline in the amount of the sick leave buyout, which is paid at the rate of 25%. Uh, so just kind of interesting to watch how that's been changing since we're coming back from, from COVID. And we're seeing an increase in sick leave use. So that kind of corresponds, I think, you know, now that we're coming back into the office more um, when people are getting sick, they're, they're staying home, which is good. We want them. We want them to do that. Yeah. We currently have 35 employees using uh, leave under FEMLA. We see a mix of um, using FEMLA for their own in illness to take care of family members or for baby bonding. We have a couple employees who've recently started participating in the infant at workplace uh, program again. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of fun to see the babies coming back oh, into great. the to the workplace. That kind of all got put on hold, of course, during COVID. So nice to see that. So this yeah. slide gives us a visual of our job applicants and hires by ethnicity. As you recall from the last time we looked at this, it's important to look at the demographics of the available workforce. So the number of applicants and or hire, hires are low in these groups, um, Hispanic, Latino, we had 6.7% applied, 5.3% uh, that were hired for a total of seven people. And the population in Washington State, Washington State for that group is 14%. So that's one we can definitely uh, continue to, to work on. Um, Native American, Alaska Native is also low with 0.09% applied, 1.5% uh, hired, which is two people and the Washington population is 2%. Hmm. Where's, where are, well, I'll actually, never mind. Yeah, so let's see. Um, I was also gonna mention, there's also a new category for Middle Eastern or North African. So people who descended from places such as Lebanon, Lebanon uh, Iran, Egypt, and Syria, had been encouraged to identify as white, but now we have the option, they have the option of identifying themselves in that new group. Also of note is that many applicants and hires identify as two or more races, and we don't know what those races are. Um, so next slide. So these are just a continuation of notes from the previous slide. Um, the number of applicants for Black, Native, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Asian, and White are more closely aligned to their population percentages. So, Next slide. House Bill 2216 uh, went into effect on June 6th. 
in order to reduce barriers to state government. It prohibits requiring a two or four year college degree as the only way to demonstrate qualifications unless it's required by law. Our job postings already meet this criteria as we allow a combination of education and experience to meet our men qualifications. We're expecting an executive order soon that will give us even more direction around hiring. I just want to say that our recruitment team continues to do an excellent job with outreach for our open positions. We've grown our LinkedIn followers to over 900. I think it started at like 33 or something. So mm -hmm. they've really been working on that. This slide shows the appointments so far this year. The director's office had three, enforcement had 16, finance two, IT 13, licensing four, thankfully none for HR, and I'm hoping to keep it that way. <laughs> I know, I think um, Director Wax mentioned she's got a few more in the works, so her total I think is even a little above that when you look at it through June, so that group has really been making some good progress. We've had 18 people separate so far this year, and we're continuing. Uh, next slide, please. Is that an average kind of? Yeah, thing? I think so, that? yeah. Uh, so we're continuing to offer the exit interviews when appropriate. So for example, we don't offer if the employee was separated during their probationary period or for disciplinary reasons, because we know they're not gonna be too happy at that point. Um, we're seeing people leave for retirement and promotional opportunities, which has kind of been the trend. Um, the majority of the feedback regarding the agency culture and relationship with their supervisor has been positive overall. Yeah. Um, the HR team is also working on a toolkit for the internet site that will include some recognition and retention ideas. Uh, we're going to try to get people to do stay interviews and find out what's working well for oh. people and um, what might make their experience even better. Right. Uh, moving on to training, WATEC is rolling out a new IT security training that will be available on July 1st and includes 11 separate modules. Employees will need to take it within 30 days. Um, that training hasn't been updated for many years. I'm going to say like over 10 years. So mm -hmm. we're happy to see new content. <laughs> Um, I personally had the other one memorized, so I was doing really well with it. Um, <laughs> we're at 88% completion rate for the current training, so we, we do pretty well with that one. We're also making great progress in our DEI training. We now have 133 people that have, have completed all four modules. Second. What's the, what are we hearing? Oh, somebody not muted. We're getting some strange. We're hearing somebody's conversation coming over. OK, sorry, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> didn't hear it. Um, so uh, we have 133 people that have completed all four of the DEI modules. Um, the agency is in the process of bringing a half day in person DEI training this fall that will complement this training. And we're really excited. excited we interviewed um, Jim Weatherly and I interviewed several different um, options and we found one that I think is going to be a really great fit. He's um, claims to be very interactive and um, upbeat and so I think it'll it'll be a nice one to have. And then these next two slides we continue to work uh, on our policies that reach the four year mark which is when we're supposed to look at them and uh, make changes. This group um, of policies was primarily just general updates and updating relevant laws and definitions, so nothing too um, too exciting with those. The rest of them. And then finally, we're winding down on our grievances that went to arbitration for those people that were separated because of the COVID um, vaccination. We just have one that's still pending, and we expect to have that um, decision anytime from, from the arbiter. And I also say that um, Don is busy with collective bargaining for both of our contracts, and 
going to a lot of meetings and bargaining sessions. So uh, we'll see what comes of that. And with that, if there's any questions, I'm happy to try to answer. Questions for Anita from the board? No. One quick one just on that last slide. How do we do on the arbitration? So how many cases was this and how many uh, were found in our favor? We did well. We had one that was a settlement. Um, we had one that we were upheld on and um, this one, that, this last one that's pending. So we did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we that's did great. Good. good. Well done. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. You. Okay. Um, our next item is a policy and rules team update. Um, and I'll turn it over to Cassidy West, our policy and rules manager. Okay. Great. Oh, my background. Well, I'm going to pretend like I'm in this office today. Okay. Um, nice good points. morning, Chair Postman, board members Garrett and Volendroff. Um, so uh, we have a few reworkings on our timelines that we provided. Dana provided an update last week. Um, so for the medical cannabis excise tax rule, um, we are pushing the timeline back just to the next board meeting. So it was planned to be presented next week on the 18th. Um, and this is assuming we, we won't have the meeting on the 3rd of July. Um, so we decided to slightly delay the 102 to incorporate feedback that we received during last week's engagement sessions. Um, on the draft rule language we currently have. So this means that um, instead of presenting on the 18th, we'll present the 102 on the uh, July 17th. And then if that's approved, a public hearing will be held on September 25th. And um, if a supplemental 102 is not needed, then we'll plan on filing the 103 on October 2nd. Um, and since project timelines are being extended a little bit, we will accept um, any last minute feedback through the rest of the week. Um, and interim guidance has been provided to license uh, licenses in the meantime. Um, any questions about that? Okay, okay, great. Um, so I honestly did not know we, I was doing a full update today because Daniel did that last week for the for the group. Um, that is the only change that we have from last week, um, and I'm I'm happy to follow up um, with any other information, but no other changes. Okay, that's great. Okay. Any questions for Ms. West? No. Okay. Thanks, Cassie. All right, great. I'm going to pass it to Jeff, and then I'll be back for a for a petition preview. Oh, OK, great. Good morning. Um, good morning, Chair Postman and board members Garrett and Volendroff. At next week's board meeting on J Tuesday, June 18th, I will present the response to a rulemaking petition requesting a change to WAC 314-55106 uh, related to labeling the cannabis warning symbol on product packages. The petition was received on April 29th, 2024 from Mike Lucero on behalf of Olympi Olympic Reef LLC and requests the agency consider rulemaking to clarify that the principal display panel on a cylindrical package um, like a pre-roll tube or a jar is the oblong portion of the cylinder and not the top or the bottom of the cylindrical package. The petitioner indicates that the requested change is aligned with uh, current industry practices. So under the current rule, um, all cannabis products consumed orally must have a label on the principal display panel with the universal cannabis warning symbol and edibles must also have an additional label that states not for kids. The principal display panel is the part of the container most prominently displayed and examined under retail conditions. The PDP typically uh, includes the brand name and the product name and the serving size requirements. For a cylindrical package, the PDP is the area on the package that faces forward when the product is displayed on the shelf and the agency has guidance available to illustrate what the PDP would be on a cylindrical package. 
Uh, since uh, guidance is available illustrating the PDP and the current rules do not conflict with the petitioner's request to have the PDP labeled on the cylindrical area of the tube, our informal recommendation to the board today is to deny the petition request. Uh, next week, I will be presenting a formal response to the board that includes additional detail about the petitioner's request and our analysis to develop uh, the recommendation. So um, thank you, uh, and I can answer any questions about the petition or the response. Uh, one, just to make sure I'm understanding, uh, is the petition in essence then to put in rule what we already have in guidance? Well, yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, the 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 term principal display panel is um, already defined in the WAC and is fairly specific about having the 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 surface that's most prominently displayed uh, facing um, out. And and the guidance just uh, uh, provides a more detailed written description and also provides some graphics which portray. Um, different types of packaging and how the how the um, uh, display panel is determined for those um, for for square or rectangular boxes it's different but for the cylindrical packages um, they're they're presented usually with the curved uh, surface outward and that's how the how it's defined but but the 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 um, the packaging and labeling guide was updated effective June 1st, 2020, and it very clearly illustrates. And that, that was after the conclusion of the rulemaking that, that established the principal display panel and the requirement for the warning symbols. Okay. All right. Makes sense to me. Thank you. Yeah, Great. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. And I will pass it on to back to Cassidy. All right. Uh, great, thank you, Jeff. Um, OK, so this morning I'm going to preview a response to three separate petitions that were received, all requesting rule changes to the social equity license mobility requirements and WAC 3145570. The petitions were received on May 17th, May 22nd, and May 23rd from Zachary Steve, David Rose, and Casey Calhoun, respectively. I'll be presenting the petition response to the board with a formal rec recommendation to either accept or deny the petition at the upcoming petitions at the upcoming board meeting on the 18th. Um, all three petitioners are making requests for rulemaking to change the social equity license mobility requirements to reflect the statutory changes um, to RCW 69-5335. Um, that was uh, changes that resulted from and grew second substitute bill 5080. Um, the change to the statute would allow social equity licensees ad additional flexibility to locate their business license compared with what that statute was previously. Um, and uh, prior to just prior to the legislation, the statute provided that social equity applicants may be located anywhere in the county. Uh, to which the license is originally issued, but can't locate outside of that county. Whereas under um, e, uh, 5080, uh, social equity licenses have the flexibility to locate their license in any city, town, or uh, any city, town, or county that would allow business operations, but they can't move the license outside of the city, town, or county after it's been issued. The petitioners indicate the change is needed because current applicants um, that under HB 2870 are having a difficult time finding and securing a location due to restrictive local zoning uh, ordinances and that not being able to secure a location um, ultimately uh, results in them not being able to open and can subsequently hinder economic success. So at next week's meeting, I'll provide de more detail about the petitioner's uh, formal uh, request and a formal recommendation, along with our analysis to support the recommendation. Uh, we're currently finalizing our analysis of the peti petitioner's request and do not have an informal recommendation for the board today. However, I will mention that we are um, addressing the license mobility or uh, 
it, I'm sorry, we're exploring how to address the license mobility <laughs> requirements um, and the open rulemaking to implement 5080. And so we do encourage the public to provide input on the petitioner's request to guide our recommendation to the board for the petition about whether and how uh, license mobility uh, policy should be addressed in the rule. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Uh, this is Sally. So, uh, are you going to bring a recommendation to us before June 18th for meeting? Yes, and I will say we are leaning towards recommending that the board accept the petition. Um, it would align with, uh, you know, the rulemaking that we're doing, and there was uh, quite an interest from from several different parties, not only in the petition, but that we've received. Um, throughout the stakeholder engagement process as we've been developing the rules, um, so, so it would very much align with that. Okay, thanks. Of course. Okay, I'm okay. going to pass it to Daniel. Okay. Good morning, Chair Postman, members Garrett and Volendroff. I did just have a quick um, a slight correction for the timeline for implementing substitute House Bill 1453. The um, that timeline, we are going to be filing the CR 102 July 17th, but the public hearing will be held August 28th and the CR 103 will be filed September 11th so that rule language will be effective October 12th. Um, initially, the rule language was going to be effective September 14th, but we still have the interim guidance in place until then. And just to be clear, we're talking about the uh, tax exemption on medical cannabis, right? Yes, implementing substitute House Bill 1453 on the medical cannabis patient excise tax exemption. Great, excellent, thank you. Next, at next week's board meeting, I'll be requesting approval for two CR 103s regarding prohibited conduct rulemaking and medical cannabis endorsement rulemaking which is the subject of separate rulemaking, not which is not the excise tax. Um, just briefly, um, the prohibited conduct rulemaking, we had the public hearing on June 5th. One person testified in favor of our rule changes. So we're gonna be filing the finalized rules as filed in the CR 102 on April 24th. We're appealing WAC 314.11.015 and removing cross references to it in six other rules. I'm sorry, that's the 314.11.050. You'd think I'd have that memorized by now. Uh, uh, and um, that repeal will be filed on June 18th, the repeal effective July 19th. Um, I'm just, you know, th I can answer any questions. I'm assuming there aren't any, but just in case I can answer any questions. I think we're good. Great. And then uh, on the medical cannabis endorsement front, um, this filing will also be done June 18th. The rule language changes effective July 19th. This is changes to WAC 314.55080. I talked about all the rule changes um, in the public hearing held last week, so I won't go over those again today. I'll go over them again tomorrow, but um, we didn't have any testimony at the June 5th public hearing. While there were some um, requested changes in written comment, um, we're not going to be adopting those changes. And mainly that's because the main change that was asked for was to add a requirement in rule that specifically states that the form required to add the endorsement needs to be completed in order to get the endorsement. Um, the second requested change is to have that form that needs to be filled out also identify the cannabis consultant. The reason we aren't um, incorporating those changes regarding the first one is that for every other endorsement we have, we don't specifically state in rule that the endorsement needs to be completed. The form needs to be completed to get the endorsement. This seems like an, from our perspective, an unnecessary additional language, and it's not clear what adding that in rule would really accomplish. Um, you already need to do that. I don't so it's again, it's not clear what the violation or what adding that requirement to rule would accomplish. Um, 
The second one about naming the cannabis consultant. Um, the problem there is that statute specifically allows someone to uh, add an endorsement while they're applying for a retail license. And in that situation, someone wouldn't necessarily have a named cannabis consultant yet because they're still applying for their license. In order to name a cannabis consultant on that form, they would need to hire staff before they've actually gotten their license, which is not feasible or realistic to expect. And additionally, it's also not clear what naming the consultant at the time of application would accomplish. Um, staff at a retailer can come and go. Um, so again, um, but that being said, as I mentioned before, we will need to make changes to the endorsement form to reflect the new endorsement requirements, but it's not clear that these changes or specifying these changes in rule are necessary. Um, and thank you, and I can answer any questions. Um, one one uh, quick thing, you said you would have more to say tomorrow. You mean next Wednesday? Yes, that's right. I meant, I meant next oh, Tuesday. Wednesday. Next Tuesday is actually yeah, what you said. That's, that's correct. Next Tuesday. I'm used to giving caucus the doing caucus the day before. Um, oh, no. Yes. Dustin has told me what I meant when I meant to tell you what you meant. <laughs> so I'm glad we could clear that up. I was going to say, thank, thankfully, we've got Dustin to tell us what we mean. Takes a village. <laughs> Takes a village. So, OK, thank you for all of that. Thank you. I think that's it on the rulemaking side. Um, we're to um, board member and executive assistant reports. Dustin, anything? Uh, not for me today. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> board members? Nothing? OK, we'll adjourn then. Thanks, everybody. We'll uh, see you. Uh, Wednesday is the executive management yes. team meeting at 1.30 in the afternoon, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I thought Justin was telling me I was wrong, but he was just so excited that I was right. <laughs> he was uh, reacting. So, OK, tomorrow, 1.30. Thanks, everybody. We're adjourned. Thank you. I wanted to talk about board meetings, but I can't bring myself.